Everybody settle back in. Uh, it is marvelous to be back from Nigeria, and I want to say pretty much over a jet lag, I think maybe for Pete and Marty too. I think we're pretty close to back to normal, back on our own time zone. They say it takes uh, one day for every, uh, every hour. So we're just about there in eight hours, so we got back a week ago Saturday, so this is the eighth day. New beginning, we're back in our time zone, so what a praise. Uh, well, good morning. Uh, Mother's Day is just ahead of us next month, so we're already getting ready for that. And uh, I want to say what a big day it is. And I just want to say that uh, I had a chance to speak about a mom from Nigeria. She was the first ever woman Supreme Court Justice of Nigeria. And we had dinner in her home uh, while we were in Nigeria. It's the second time we've been to her house. And I spoke about her on Mother's Day last year, but I mentioned that I spoke about her. And, but she's pretty incredible. And she sends her greetings. As a matter of fact, the largest church in Abuja, one of our sister churches there, they send their greetings through Reverend Mina this morning. They're a church of about 1,500 people. And they say shalom and howdy in Nigerian. <laughs> Howdy, how y'all doing? And, uh, but greetings from them as well. Uh, I wanted to show a couple of things that happened this week. Uh, uh, and if we can show those up on the slide. Oh, boy. That's me and Rico. And Rico is now a part of Adult Teen Challenge. And uh, yay! And so I was at a fundraiser Friday night for them, and it was fantastic. There were hundreds of people there, and it was a donation kind of dinner. And I saw people from all over Adult Teen Challenge. I've had, a, believe it or not, a long experience with them. And I worked in a ministry at Cooks and Hills Christian Ministries that was also part of Teen Challenge, where I met, uh, and I was a little starstruck, where I met Nikki Cruz from Crossing the Switchblade. And of course, it was the founder of Adult Teen Challenge and Teen Challenge that basically brought Nikki Cruz to the Lord. And so uh, uh, Pastor David Wilkerson from Times Square Ministry. It's amazing, that was a long time ago, but now to actually be affiliated with them and have them on our campus here, we're gonna have the first ever uh, home, uh, or I should say rehabilitative counseling center in Covington, first ever, is going to be right here on our campus. And then next year, it's, oh, praise the Lord. The next year, um, uh, Union Gospel Mission is going to open up a work right next door. And I want to say, Brian Chandler and the city of Covington, my hat's off to them. They are really thinking about recovery, the homeless population, and they're spending city dollars toward it, and ministries are spending you know, their uh, prayers and capital toward it. And I want to say, what a good thing. But they now have the keys, Adult Teen Challenge, and they're going to be doing counseling right here from our campus. So they got to get all set up, and uh, it was pretty cool. Uh, I have to say that I heard a city council person from Puyallup, he gave uh, the talk, the speech, uh, the sermon, and it was a Holy Spirit on fire message from a member of city government, a councilman, who uh, talked and gave God the glory for everything. And he listed the names of God. And he said, man, God is not a God who backs up, shuts up, or quits. You know, he's in it all the time, 24-7. That's a God you can trust. And I want to say, man, from somebody from city council to actually say that, I was like, amen, hallelujah, brother, preach it. And so it was incredible. And all the young men and women that we've seen in recovery, all the alumni, incredible stuff. I've been kind of long on this, but I also bought something too. And uh, we can go ahead and roll that uh, slide. Oh boy, there it is. For those of you that the uninitiated, that's a menorah. <laughs> it's a hand-built wooden menorah that's now in our kitchen. And uh, it was an auction item. <laughs> <laughs> That's it, and it was absolutely beautiful. I am Jewish. Hey, it's a menorah, right? So uh, I bid and won the bid, and so, man, uh, but uh, I had to bid a couple of times, but 
It's absolutely beautiful. I'm sure we'll probably see it here at some point, and, uh, but it's absolutely beautiful. And I want to say I was so happy to bid toward it and uh, contribute toward and our congregation toward Adult Teen Challenge. And uh, what an award-winning program for the Lord. So, yeah, that's kind of that. And uh, it's been a busy week for those of us just coming back in, and I'm sure it's been a busy week for you. And uh, we're starting a new sermon series on the book of Titus. And so setting things in order, Titus 1.5 is going to be uh, our key scripture for this. And it's really about church leadership as we look at um, how do we select leaders, how do we appoint them. And it seems like it'd be a ho-hummer, except for this is no ho-hum story on church leadership. Usually church leadership, there's always a message on the back, and there is, you know, about, hey, step forward for leadership. Tithing messages usually have that, hey, why don't you tithe? And the church could use the money. And, uh, you know, so there's always those kind of things. But church leadership is kind of amazing. And uh, church leadership is kind of a funny thing because on the one hand, uh, nobody really feels qualified to do it, do they? Yeah, does anybody feel qualified to lead a church? <laughs> no. <laughs> on the other hand, we've got to have leadership, right? Because without vision, there, there can't be any leadership. So leaders have visions, and God has a vision for his church. What's that? Sacrifice. And sacrifice. Yeah. Leadership gets tested, and I want to say that's the other thing. And today we see an absence of leadership almost everywhere. Across our country, city government, local leadership, church leadership, you know, people just don't want to stand up. And it's a tough thing, but here Titus gives us some qualifying markers. And so... Um, you can be fit to lead and serve in a church. And Timothy also goes right along with that as well. Timothy also gives us some great tips on how to lead a church. So as a Marine, uh, I learned lessons about leadership. And so many, many moons ago, uh, many of you are aware that I was a service member. That was my first profession. For 12 years, I wore a uniform and defended the country and in various roles and capacities. And we learned the lessons of leadership, and some of them weren't easy. Um, and so um, we studied leaders, you know, what they did and how they learned to lead, and then we studied doctrine of leadership. But the key element that was there, and you'll see that in this particular piece that we're going to look at in Titus, the key element is character. It's character over qualification, and we don't think about that. Character over qualification. And so uh, I wanted to give a quote from a famous Desert Storm general, Storm and Norman, and uh, he was quite a leader, and I actually saw him in a parade in Louisville, Kentucky. He was riding in a 53 Cadillac convertible, El Dorado, and... Uh, uh, it was absolutely incredible, but he was really quite a leader. Uh, I want to say not soft-spoken at all, pretty big guy, big West Pointer, and, uh, but he was an incredible leader. And one of the things he said is, leadership is a potent combination of strategy and character, but if you have to be without something, be without the strategy. That means have character. Be a person of character. I want to say that's what Titus is about as well. Character matters. And it's funny that some of our greatest sages and spokesmen in the church have said that too. Dr. Martin Luther King said, content of their character. That's how we should be known. Character matters. And when we don't see good conduct and good character, well, we know it. Man, there's everything else that's not good if you don't have character. 2 Corinthians 12.9 basically has a similar ring. God doesn't call the qualified. He qualifies the called. Yeah, 2 Corinthians 12, 9 through 10, it goes on to elaborate a little bit more about that. But yeah, a lot of us don't feel qualified 
to lead or do those kind of things, um, but there's a list of things that we can take a look at that's important for us to think about. Um, in the core, we learned and studied leadership traits and strategies and to become good leaders because you've got to learn those things and they're learnable. Are we born with that kind of knowledge, how to lead? No, we're not. We're not born with much, are we? Yeah. Um, ba <laughs> What's that? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Man, yeah, we're not born with much, but everything that we learn, man, that's important to us. It's a learning environment that we're in. You can now see why Jesus came as a teacher, because he had to teach us. And so we had to be students. We had to be humble enough to learn. When we were in Nigeria, we had a chance to talk with um, some young students, about 300, almost 300 uh, students, uh, young people in their 20s who were just starting out in the world and starting out in their own business adventures and things like that. And they wanted to talk on how to be an entrepreneur. And so I gave them basically a talk, Pete, Marty, and myself, on what are characteristics that make you a good business person but make you a good person in general. One of those things was um, honesty, being honest, not lying, telling the truth. You know, being straightforward about that. The other was integrity and relationship, key elements. You know, if you want to start out good in life, start out with those kind of things. Start out with those principles. And it's funny, after we'd spoken for an hour and a half, we still had 20 or 30 people that wanted to know more. I want to say that was encouraging. That was encouraging. I grew up... Um, in the Marine Corps, learning 14 traits, and we don't have time in this talk, it's not really a talk about leadership or leadership traits, so we don't have time this morning, but I thought I would share some of them with you, what leadership traits look like, and you can study them and you can learn about them, just as we're going to learn about the things that Paul shares with us, uh, with Titus, in the book of Titus, so that bears his name. But here's kind of some of the traits um, that we studied, that I studied as a young Marine and as an officer. Uh, number one, and they're not in any particular order, is bearing, courage, decisiveness, dependability, endurance, enthusiasm, initiative, and I already mentioned integrity. Integrity is an important thing, to be true to your word, to say what you mean and do it, to live by it. Judgment, justice, knowledge, loyalty, tact, and unselfishness. A leader's got to be unselfish. He can't think about himself in the equation. I want to say it's nice that this is last because it's an important one. To be unselfish. And we see all of these qualities in Jesus Christ. He exemplifies each one of these qualities. Leadership is a biblical thing, and I have to say that had I not been a Marine, had I not been a service member, I never would have understood what servant leadership was about. And that's exactly the kind of leadership that we practice. You lead from the front, uh, you follow these principles, you learn them, you live them, and then you lead by them, and you do them. You exemplify what they are. Are we perfect when we lead as humans? No. That's why we have a list of things, right? Because we need to be reminded. We need to go back and do those things. The whole book of Titus is about that. We're going to look at appointment for leaderships in chapter 1, but we're going to look at some of the other things in the last book is to remind. So all of those characteristics. I also have to say as an officer, one of the other mottos or maxims that we live by was that... Um, we neither lie, cheat, nor steal, nor tolerate those who do. And that was one of the things, I can't tell you how many times I heard an officer repeat those kind of things. But as leaders and as believers and followers of Christ, man, we have to live that stuff too. Sometimes we have to have moral fiber. We have to have moral turpitude. And we have to say if something's wrong, 
it's wrong and stand up toward it. And I want to say that's an important thing about Christians. We do those things and we lead from the front. Sometimes we don't always see front leading in the church, but honestly, we're seeing it more and more, and we're seeing it across the globe. I've seen some great Christian leaders, you know, and it starts right here at our level, in our households, in our house. And so we're going to take a look at some of that. Um, so believers and followers of Christ, you can identify and you can follow the principles and guidelines that we're going to look at for both the church, Christian leadership, family, leadership, eldership. It's laid out by Paul both in Titus and in First and Second Timothy. And they'll help you not only select good leaders, but also how to become one. Who's ready to deep dive into Titus chapter 1? Amen and amen. Okay, so turn to your Bibles to Titus chapter 1. And I want to kind of give just a little bit of background on this, too. So uh, the church of Titus, uh, Titus's world, was a little bit like maybe a world that we live in today. It's a uh, Crete is where uh, Titus was uh, called to. And Titus was, uh, he was a friend of Paul. He's mentioned uh, several times throughout the New Testament. Book of Acts, uh, I want to say Ephesians also, don't quote me on that one exactly. But um, he was part of the missionary journeys uh, that Paul took, and Titus wasn't mentioned a lot. Titus is kind of interesting too because Titus doesn't come from the church of Jerusalem. Titus is a Gentile, he's Greek. And so kind of an interesting prospect. And so the church is leaving Jerusalem, it's leaving its moorings, and it's going out into the world. It's becoming a global, worldwide church. Its leadership is reflecting that. Titus is reflecting that. And Titus is a little bit different, maybe, than Timothy. Timothy comes from a Jewish background, uh, familiar with that, but the church is evolving and changing. And some of the precautions that Paul gives to Timothy, he doesn't give to Titus. Titus is a different kind of leader from a different kind of world. So he doesn't give him any of the pre-talks, you know, oh, be careful about this. He just says, I'm giving you charge. Take charge and do these things. Because the environment that Titus is going into is Crete. And the Cretes, they were a pretty tough group of individuals. They were known for being liars, cheats, swindlers. You know, they traveled all over the globe. They were mercenaries for the Roman army. I mean, if it was about chicanery, the, uh, uh, those from Crete were about it. And I think you might have grown up with the term at a certain age, don't be a Cretan. Yeah, it comes from that time. Yeah, don't be a Cretan, because they were the worst of the worst. And uh, there was a big Jewish community that lived there too, because it was, uh, Crete was right in the Aegean Sea. It's near Greece. Uh, it's an island nation, lots of cities, lots of ports, and a pretty rough group of people, rough talking, rough living. And so that was the kind of environment you kind of had to be tough as nails to go in and settle that because uh, I had another friend who was an officer, a major. He used to say, if you're going to lead tigers, you got to be the biggest, baddest one. And that's Titus. He's going to go in there and he's going to appoint leaders that are completely the opposite of the culture that, he's, uh, that they're trying to minister to. And so that's kind of the backdrop of what this is about. And uh, it's funny how Paul starts out this letter in that way, but I'll read each section, and then I'll kind of go over and talk about a little commentary on each of the pieces. But um, yeah, it's kind of interesting because Zeus is their chief god too. And uh, Zeus is kind of known as a liar, a seducer, a swindler. You don't, you don't know what Zeus is going to do. But man, Paul really starts out in a different narrative when it comes to the God of the Bible and the God of Scripture. So let's take a look at Titus 1, uh, verse 1. And we'll kind of read through uh, verse 4. And we'll just take a look at that before we dive into uh, verse 5. So Paul a servant of God, an apostle of Jesus Christ, 
to further the faith of God's elect and their knowledge of the truth that leads to godliness in the hope of eternal life, which God does not lie, promised before the beginning of time. Verse 3, and which now at his appointed season he has brought to light through the preaching entrusted to me by the command of God our Savior. To Titus, my true son in common faith, grace, peace from God and the Father and Jesus Christ our Savior. And in the King James that reads, grace, mercy, and peace. Those three elements. Now, I'm going to go back and kind of talk about this just a little bit. So Paul really starts out in a huge way because his job is to select leaders of Crete. So they're nation building, aren't they? Yeah, Paul is selecting leaders from the command of God, as we see in verse 4. And so he uses the term servant of God. In Hebrew, that's called a sarel, a servant of the Most High God. But in Greek, it's the word doulos. It's the lowest form of slave that there is. And it's often a volunteer. Someone who has said, I'm a slave to this household, I'm a slave to this master. And I'm volunteering, I'm saddling up for whatever it is. That's how Paul identifies himself. If he had a business card, he would have slave on his card, although he'd be a CEO by any stretch of the imagination for any modern business. Slave is what he leads with. And look, if you're a slave for Jesus Christ, he's the most famous, biggest person in human history. I think I'd rather be a slave in his house, I know I would, than to, uh, to be chief in any other. But that's Paul, man. He comes out and he's humble about the whole thing. He's not taking the high road. He's saying, I'm a slave, the lowest slave, to Jesus Christ, the Most High God. And so that's what he leads with, an apostle, an appointed one, a sent one of Jesus Christ to further the faith of God's elect and the common knowledge of the truth that leads to godliness. And so uh, the term elect here and the knowledge of that, it's common. So it is, uh, he's not uh, making a doctrinal statement per se, but he's just saying, man, it's for you, the elect of God. It is for you in hope of eternal life. And so I want to say in some ways the term eternal life is a trump card. I mean, he just basically came out and just said it. Here's my card. It's about life. God's deal is about life and about your life and living it more abundantly. God came and Jesus died so that you could live life more abundantly. He raised up his own life so that you could also believe that life is possible. Life from the dead, life from your circumstances, life from your consequences, life is possible. God is a God of life. He's a God of the living. That's Paul's message. That preempts all other doctrines and all other things that people teach and talk about. God is a God of life. Amen. 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 He brings life and he is life itself. And so, unlike Zeus, who the Cretans are familiar with, God does not lie. There's no need for him to lie. He'll tell you the truth. Shame the devil. But he will tell the truth every single time. God is a God of truth, of absolute truth. And so, different from the gods that they have known or the culture that they lived in, God is a God of truth. He does not lie. He promised from before the beginning that eternal life was possible and that he designed you exactly for that. He promised you eternal life. He promised you to live forever with him in his environment. And he will make good on that promise. You can take that to the bank every day. That is God's charge. That's the doctrine. That's the most essential thing to us. His blood saves, his blood saves, it's essential to the faith, and that God resurrected from the dead, and he brings life, and life eternal. He designed it from the beginning, 
Everything that he's done has been about causing those things to happen, not for him, but for us. An amazing thing. In the appointed season, he brings all this about in each of these seasons. We've just gone through Easter. We're just now closing to the Passover season. At the right time, Christ died for us. And he made all these things happen. He brought this to light through uh, teaching and entrusted, uh, was entrusted by the commands of God by our Savior. And I'll say this, by the command of God, nobody chooses to serve God directly. That's not a choice. You're appointed to it. That's a funny thing to think about, like leadership. Man, nobody volunteers. You can try. I once heard a pastor say uh, to me directly, if you're called to ministry, you will fail at everything you put your hand to. You will not succeed. If you're called to anything else, that you will succeed in. You will not succeed in ministry. It's a calling. Ministry is a calling. It's not of your choice. It's by his calling. It's by his command and his directive. But you can seek those things Look after those things. And if he's calling, man, that's a big deal. Nobody volunteers for it. Paul didn't sign up for this. And as we look at his story, we know he didn't. Uh, struck by something more than lightning. And, uh, yeah, blinded by the light. Titus, my true son in the common faith. And this is a coiny faith, uh, like the language of Greek common and so in the common faith and there's something simple about our faith at the core of it it's super simple that basically god gives life and he gives it to you abundantly and he gives it to you freely at the core of our message that's what it's about god loves you and he gave his life for you so that you would have life and that is the core message if you believe that you are saved you're his you've been called by him you're elect, you're anointed, appointed. Grace, peace, and mercy to you. Now it gets complicated for these reasons because uh, in verse 5, and this is kind of our key piece, the reason I left you in Crete was that you might put in order uh, what was left unfinished and appoint elders in every town as I directed you. So God directed Paul, and so he's directing now his son, his Gentile son in the faith. He is now directing him to appoint leaders in the church. And uh, because what's in the church there currently is absolutely a train wreck. It is absolutely a disaster. It couldn't be worse. Uh, it's run amok. It's absolutely bad. And so Titus is not like Timothy. Titus is kind of, he's the guy that you call to appoint leaders. And he has a special calling and anointing. He knows what they look like. He knows he should be called. And it doesn't appear anywhere that anybody gets voted on. I don't see a vote anywhere. There's democracy in the world at this time, but nobody gets voted on. They get appointed. And I want to say what a powerful thing that is. It doesn't mean that local house churches didn't have votes and say, oh yeah, he's a great leader. You know, look at his resume. They probably did some of that too. But Timothy, uh, excuse me, Titus had the ability to go and appoint leaders that were worthy of the calling and that could basically change the society, that could change the church because the church would struggle and not succeed had Titus not come to Crete to set the record straight. And that's what Titus does. Titus has a very powerful position. Yeah, he's not just a kingmaker, he's a churchmaker. He has a call of God to basically set stuff straight. I want to say, in my old days, we used to call those guys head knockers. You know, they'll knock the heads together. It's kind of like a Three Stooges thing, you know, bing, bing. 
But that's his job, is to find those leaders because, and not to mess around about it, but to find good quality people who can lead God's people and basically change the society. And that's the kind of stuff that we need to think about too in our time and space, because we live in Crete. Man, we live in a rowdy, wild place. In Crete, women didn't marry because, and they didn't have children because they, they wanted to stay single. Guys were like that too. And they followed all that stuff. They lived the party life. They did all of those things. But they couldn't build a decent society from it. It was hard to find leaders and they didn't have the background for it. They were known for rowdy life a rowdy lifestyle. So this is Titus's job. He's going to look for those people. And he says this, an elder must be blameless, faithful to one wife, a man uh, whose children believe and who do not, are not open to being charged uh, of being wild and disobedient. And 1 Timothy 3, verses 1 through 7, kind of cover some of those things too. Does it mean that you can't ever be divorced, man of one wife? No, I'm not saying that. Just one wife at a time. I had a person from Saudi Arabia once say to me, you know, that Americans practiced uh, polygamy one wife at a time. And I thought, oh, yeah. Oh, don't we? You know, but it has to be a person who can, who has a, a decent house. And are there reasons why people get divorced? Yeah, Moses allowed it. There were reasons why. Moses allowed it. But a person um, who has one wife at a time, and I'll say this too, because we don't often think about this, what if you don't have any wife? Can you still serve in the church? Absolutely. Otherwise, Jesus and Paul himself would have been disqualified because they were never married. Wow. Wow. None of us are perfect at leadership, but we can kind of see the principles of it and we can practice it and think about it. Their houses are not crazy. They're not debaucherous. They're not full of liars, cheats, and swindlers. Not any of those things, but they're calm and even keel. Um, they are not open to the charge of wild, uh, being wild and disobedient. Verse 7, since an overseer... Uh, manages God's household, he must be blameless. So you can't really be, you know, you can't be a scandalous kind of person if you're going to lead God's church. You kind of got to leave the scandals behind. Do scandals happen? Yeah, look across the church today. Are some of them fair? Does the enemy play that game? Of course he does. But for the most part, it should be scandal-free. Um, there's um, a term that's used for overseer, but it's where we get the word bishop. Um, it is, I'm trying to remember the Greek of this, but it is, um, it is uh, episco episcopos, episcopos is the term that's used in the Greek for, uh, so we get the term bishop, leader, pastor, overseer, one who looks over uh, a supervisor is a similar term. It all comes from this background, shepherd, pastor. All of these things are part of the criteria for, uh, and we can also see in 1 Timothy 3, part of the criteria for what a leader is. So shouldn't be overbearing, not quick-tempered, not given to drunkenness or violence, not pursuing dishonest gain. It should be an honest person not looking to build their own household. And I want to say, just take a look at our Senate and Congress. You know, uh, yeah, you shouldn't build your household on the back of the nation. Uh, is it okay to do okay in uh, Congress and Senate? Yeah. Is it okay to do okay in church as a leader, as a pastor? Yeah, you'd hope so. You'd hope that they did well. But dishonest gain is a whole different thing. Corruption. Yeah. Church is racked with scandal, and so is the nation. Yeah, we live in Crete. Rather, it should be hospitable. One that's hospitable, one who loves what is good and who is self-controlled, upright, holy, and disciplined. 
And so this word in the Greek for hospitable comes from the word uh, philio, which means love, xenos, which means uh, basically is where we get xenophobia, is the fear of foreigners, but it is the love of differences, basically, or of different people. The church is made up of different people. It can't represent one culture or one group of people or one group of thought. It has to be the panoplia of the planet of humanity. It has to have men, women, children, you know, uh, people of different nationalities, you know, because God saved all the humanity. That's going to be important for the next piece that I share. Hospitality is a big thing. And I want to say the church used to have an awful lot of hospitality. We invited the stranger in, we welcomed them in, and we uh, brought our hospitality, and it made people feel warm and welcome into our invite. Um, so self-controlled, upright, holy, he must hold firmly to the trustworthy message that has been taught so that he can encourage others in sound doctrine and refute those who oppose it. And I kind of talked about that earlier. Man, sometimes as a leader, you've got to be able to stand up and go, you know what, that's not right, that's not sound doctrine, that's not what we teach, that's not what we do, and look at the harm that it will cause. And so uh, moral fiber, being able to stand up and know the difference between what is good, righteous, and holy, and what isn't. And so as a leader, you've got to be able to stand that. And you've, you've got to be able to look at it across the cultures, too. What is right? What is holy? What is sound doctrine from Paul? I'm going to go into 10. And so rebuking those who fail to not do good, who fail at that. I want to talk a little bit about this piece because it's kind of interesting. We live in this world today. So in verse 10... Um, there are many rebellious people full of meaningless talk, deception, especially those of the circumcised group. And so I want to say this about um, the Jewish community that was on Crete. It had a large Jewish community. Many of those were at Acts chapter 2 and heard Peter's speech. Many of them came back to Crete. They saw all of that stuff. They were there for the holidays. Many of them were Messianic Jews. And I'll say this, Paul himself is a Messianic Jew. He knows the difference between sound doctrine and fable. And so as believers and as leaders, we have to discern between the myth and mythology and speak about sound doctrine. Can we talk about some pretty crazy stuff in God? Absolutely, especially when it applies to Scripture. But when it comes to speculation, and it comes to traditions of men and the things that we've always done, we have to leave that aside because the main message is about life, isn't it? Paul knows the difference between sound doctrine as a Messianic Jew and what's a fable. And so it's true of the church as well, of different denominations and different groups. They have their own mythology, their own traditions, and their own fables. It's only gotten more complex. So Paul can speak to this, and so can we, because we have to be able to discern between the mythology and what's actually real. And for me, I, do, I draw the dividing line, and this may be you as well, between the substance and the form. The form I don't care so much about. The substance of the matter the heart of the doctrine, the heart of the teaching of Christ, that's the part I'm concerned about, the substance over the form. But for some people, you'll never get the form right. You'll never be able to do it right. You just won't qualify. But we can see that there are qualities and qualifications that are here. Paul is addressing this, especially to the Cretans. And so they must be silenced. They're disrupting whole households by teachings of things that ought not be taught. Some of their controversies were local to their time, but some of them still exist today. And, um, you know, people who were priests or people who were this order or that line. And we see that today in our own world. 
and I want to say sometimes we see that between Catholics and Protestants. You know, um, uh, to be a priest means you have to be unmarried and you have to follow a different teaching and doctrine. And I want to say that separates, and for a lot of time, that was a big deal. For the first 1,500 years of the church, it set a doctrine that we don't observe today. But among many, those doctrines are still true. It's interesting when we start to look at these things, but the thing that's important is, is it hospitable? No. Is it for the love of the stranger or welcoming? It absolutely isn't. It trips all the buzzers. Yeah. Can Paul talk about what good and sound doctrine is? Yes, he can. And he calls it out. He knows it well. And so as we look through the epistles that he teaches from, we can get a really good sense of what's true, honest, and reputable, and what saves people. So uh, this saying is true. Therefore, rebuke them sharply so that they will be of sound faith and pay no attention to Jewish myths or uh, merely human commands of those who reject the truth. So we can know when uh, a leader is false. Uh, we can know by his example. We can know by his teaching, by his doctrine. And especially when it begins to hurt people in a very negative way. It breaks up households, breaks up churches, it breaks up whole communities. And Paul says, you've got to call this out. Uh, to the pure, all things are pure, but to those who are corrupt and do not believe, nothing is pure. And so I want to say those kind of things can poison your mind. If you already have a corrupted mind, there's nothing that's pure, man. There's nothing that's sacred. But if you're not of that spirit, then yeah, you can discern purity, truth, spirit, all of these things. Your conscience isn't corrupted, and it can be renewed every time by the word of God and the renewing of your mind. He promises that he will do all of those things. Paul goes on to say that they claim to know God, but their actions deny him. And that's a way that we can know. The actions are deceptive. They basically, I always say you can tell uh, with someone's telling you the truth by what they do. And I would say that's an old Jewish maximum too. You know which way they're going by the way their feet go. And so, <laughs> it is true, it is true. You can know these things, know that they are detestable of God when leaders do those things. They're detestable, they're disobedient, and they're unfit for anything. And they used to write, like for buildings, they used to write an A on the stone, and it represented the Greek word for unfit for service. Because if a stone was unfit for a building, Jesus was the stone the builders rejected. They marked it so it wouldn't be used, it wouldn't be put in. And I want to say, imagine if God said, you are unfit for use in leadership. How horrible a thing that would be. You are marked with an A and not in a good way. It's not an A plus. It's an A, you're unfit. Wow. These are the things that Titus, this is his job. And I want to say it's a tough job. Not an easy job at all uh, for him to do, but... He does it in the full confidence of God. Now I'm going to go to the close. Who's ready? <laughs> right. All right. So don't be a cretin. <laughs> Man, don't be a liar, cheat, swindler. Don't do those things. Avoid them. Avoid people that do those things. We neither lie, cheat, nor steal, nor tolerate those who do. Yeah. yeah. Be a good leader. Be a good follower. Before um, Joshua became the leader of Israel from Moses, what was he? A good follower. He followed the principles. He studied those principles of leadership from Moses, which Moses learned from God. So we can learn, take advice, stay humble, be open, and uh, not be silent about evil. That's what Titus is about. It's a strong book. It's a book for us. It's a book for our time. Don't fall prey to mythologies. There's all kinds of them. You look across our world today, there's tons of mythologies. Don't fall prey to them. You know, I will not fear monger you, that's for sure. 
But I'll talk to you about what Jesus is going to do for you today, right now, and what he's going to do in the future. There's plenty of fear out there. There's plenty of mythologies to follow. Don't follow them. And don't follow people that teach them. Stay strong in the faith. Don't follow slogans or programs. P.T. Barnum said, yeah, Barnum and Bailey Circus, there's a sucker born every minute. Don't be a sucker, you know. Christians, uh, often we get accused of being sappy and melodramatic and emotional. Oh, by the way, we might want to have some clothes music. <laughs> Speaking of melodramatic. But P.T. Barnum said there's a sucker born every moment. And oftentimes, unfortunately, that happens in the church. Man, we can be suckers. We can be saps. We can fall prey to bad leadership. Don't do it. There's clear teaching on it. Be the kind of believer, follower, and leader that not only Paul calls out, but that God calls out. Now, I said this in the opening of the message, but we're looking for a few good men and women to lead. Not just for this house and today, but for the future as well. Because we have a future. It's a future of life, of hope, of freedom, of liberty. You have a message that's inside of you that's for all people. We've got to be hospitable. We've got to open up this house. You've got to open up your houses. But most importantly, you've got to open up your heart. Man, Titus, man, he's a head knocker. You be that way too. Call out the evil stuff, but look for the good stuff. Look for the good leaders. Encourage them. When it comes time to stand up, stand up. Take the appointment. If you're being appointed and called to lead, by all means lead. Does that mean you're perfect? Absolutely not. Am I perfect? No way. I fall short every day. You know, uh, humbly so. I'm just a servant of God. But we can look toward those things and we can have hope in them. This house has to grow. This community has to grow because honestly, the world needs Jesus. Every person, every heart. And if they knew what it was, they'd absolutely want it. You, you can't sell it. You have to give it freely. But if you're called to lead and God's appointing you, step forward and lead. There's plenty of help for you. There's prayer. We'll pray for you. Oh, brother. Oh, sister. But man, there's so many examples for you to lead in. And there's so many reasons, every single reason, for you to lead. We're looking for a few good men and a few good women. And some of them are growing up right now. I want to say, if you feel that call of God, and you feel like you should lead in this house, that you should be an elder or a deacon, or even a pastor, a minister, a rabbi, you should follow that call. You should seek it out. And I'm encouraging you today to do that because it isn't me that's calling, and I'm calling, but it's God himself. He's the one that calls. Man, hey. Don't be afraid of the test, and don't be afraid of the appointment because it's your appointment it's your calling. Nobody can do what God has called you to do. And maybe you like Titus, and you may be setting a generation straight. You may be setting a culture straight that's completely the opposite of the culture of God. And we're in that culture. Don't be afraid of the test, and don't be afraid of the appointment. Because it's God calling, and he will make sure that everything moves, heaven and earth, toward you because you're the goal. It's about life and life more abundantly. Let's close with a word of prayer. Father, I thank you so much uh, for this group of believers, Lord. And I feel the leaders that are in here. And I feel the appointments that are here too. And the appointments in this community. Lord, um, as we contemplate these things of Titus, appointment Father, may it be deep in our heart, these lessons of leadership, these lessons of rightness, of holiness, may they be quick in our heart. Lord, speak to us long after this message. Help us to review it. 
Help us to hear your words in our heart. Father, send your spirit, Lord. Send your leaders to lead. And Father, make your appointments known and clear. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. It's all ready.